What is the right to learn in higher education? How and where is it under threat? And by what means can academics, faculty, staff, and students best defend that right? That's the subject of this week's Future Trends Forum event. We hosted two wonderful professors, uh, Professor Ellen Schrecker, a uh, retired professor from uh, Yeshiva University, uh, as well as Valerie C. Johnson, uh, professor of political science at DePaul University. They have co-authored and co-edited a new book from Beacon Press about the right to learn and how it is under attack by the American right wing. In our conversation, we explored all these questions. We had some very, very interesting discussions and good conversation, some pushback, some planning, some hopes, and some fears. And I hope you'll enjoy the conversation that resulted. If you like these introductions that I started doing for the Future Trends Forum recordings, please let me know in the comments. And of course, if you have any questions, thoughts, responses, or ideas concerning the overall conversation, please add that in the comments as well. Hope you enjoy the hour. Hour. So let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a couple of terrific guests talking about a vital subject for the future of higher education. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. But before we kick off the conversation, I need to introduce the program, explain what it is, what we hope to accomplish, who we are, how this is supported, and then we'll start with our discussion. And discussion is the theme. For more than eight years here at the Future Trends Forum, our goal has been to use conversation to grapple with the future of higher education. We think that by bringing as many different minds to bear from as many different perspectives as possible, we can best get a handle on where colleges and universities are going. And when I say we, that means in part me. Hello, I'm Brian Alexander, your guide for the next hour, the founder and curator of the Future Trends Forum. Forum. <laughs> and with me is the excellent Wesson Radomski, who is here in case you have any technical needs. So if you have any video or audio problems, just ping Wesson and they'll be glad to help you out. Now, I say we've been doing this for almost nine years, and if you'd like to look back in our archive, uh, we have a whole set of videos on YouTube. Just go to tinyurl.com slash fdfarchive, and you can go back and look at around 430 different recordings. Now, if you'd like to look at our recordings not by time but by topic, on the forum website, we have a whole index uh, of sessions by different topics they cover. So everything from libraries to presidents to pedagogy to copyright to open source to economics to demographics all there. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. Now, looking ahead a bit, which is what we do here at the Future Trends Forum, we have a whole series of sessions coming up, uh, scheduled out right now into February of next year. And we have sessions coming up on student mental health, on what educability is, on the overall status of higher education, and we have more sessions in AI. And you can find more of those on the forum website, forum.futureofeducation.us. Now, we can only do this work with the help of some generous supporters, and I want to thank them before we go further. In New York State, Nizer Net helps us very much. They have a great program where they help colleges and universities get on blazingly fast broadband, and they also do wonderful professional development and networking work. We're grateful to them for their support. We're also grateful to Shindig because, as you can see, Shindig makes available this technology we're using right now. So if you're new to it or if you haven't been on the forum for a while, let me just quickly explain. The key thing about Shindig is that the screen has two parts. The top part is the stage. It's where I am right now, where the slide is just for a minute. We call it the stage because everybody can see and hear everything that goes on up here. And this is where our guests are going to be, and this is where you can be too. Now. Everybody else, the whole audience, is in the second part of the screen. And if you mouse over people, you can get a little bit more information about them. And in fact, if you want to have a private conversation with somebody, double click on them. And if they want to talk to you, your two icons will click together like Legos, and you can have your own private audiovisual conversation. Think of it as being in an auditorium and you lean over to whisper into somebody's ear. But how do you participate in the overall auditorium? How do you join the total conversation? Easy. Look at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a white strip running along it with a few different buttons. On the leftmost edge, 39, uh, it'll be a number there, uh, 40 now. If you press that button, that will pop up a couple of boxes, and one of them is a chat box. So people use a chat box all the time for sharing footnotes and sharing jokes, job offers, and uh, especially ideas, what we're talking about. If you haven't had a chance to yet, just introduce yourself by saying who you are and where you're from or where you are now. I'll say it myself. I'm Brian. 
in Georgetown, USA. Now, next to that little white box um, is a couple other buttons that I want to make sure you see. One of them is a raised hand, and one of them is a question mark. The question mark uh, opens up your typical Q&A box, so you can type in your question there. And when the time is right, I'll flash it on the screen for everyone to see, and I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. Now, if your camera is on and you want to join us on stage, press the raise hand button. And when the time is right, I'll beam you up on stage so you can be face-to-face -face with our guests. So those are the main ways to participate, the chat box, the Q&A box, and the raised hand. We're grateful to Shindig for making them available. And we're also grateful to our supporters on Patreon. Let me just show them off here because I'm so proud of them. Uh, the pro Patreon is a crowdfunding site where people collaboratively fund some ongoing project. In this case, it's our grappling with the future of higher education project. And people there contribute as little as a buck a month just to make sure that we pay our bills and keep the lights on and the electricity running. Uh, folks here in this image contribute $10 or more a month. People like Belinda, Bob Johnson, Hugh Blackmer, Melissa Wu, we're really grateful to them for their support. And you can join them. Just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. Okay, now all of that is introductions. Um, now I want to bring up on stage our guests for a great topic. And hello to everybody who's just introduced themselves in chat. I see we have folks from Illinois, from Arizona, from Pennsylvania, or Oregon, Missouri, more California, Massachusetts, um, my neck of the woods. Oh, good to see you all. Now, one of the things that we've been looking at uh, for years are some of the political forces that press on higher education. Some of the ways that plays out can be in terms of funding, it can be in terms of athletics, it can be in terms of scholarships, it can be in terms of race or gender. The authors and editors that we have on top this week, they have just published a book um, about the right to learn, and they position this interesting argument that political forces right now, which they'll explain, are trying to restrict some of our abilities to teach and especially, more importantly, our students' ability to learn in certain topics. Now, what that means, how that works, what we can do about it is the subject of our conversation. And in order to begin, uh, I'd like to just start off by bringing up on stage some of the editors and authors. And I'd like to begin by welcoming the eminent historian, Alan Schrecker, who is a retired professor of history, um, from most recently retired from Yeshiva University. Good afternoon, Professor Schrecker. Good afternoon, Brian, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I know that my co-editor, Jennifer, isn't going to be able to join us, uh -huh. but she told me yes, just yesterday that you were a wonderful host and that she loved being on your show. So I am really looking forward to having a great conversation this afternoon. Well, that's very kind of you to pass on and very kind of her to say. And now I'm going to have to be on the top of my game just in order to live up to all of this. Um, Professor Schrecker, um, we introduce ourselves in the forum in a peculiar way. We like to describe what we're going to be working on in the next year. So what are the big projects or the big topics? Now, you are retired, but it seems like retirement in the 20th century in the United States means working at a, diff at a different job. I I'm curious, what are you going to be doing for the next year? What are you anticipating and what are you hoping to work on? Well, let's see. We just finished this, so I'm still talking about it. Oh, dear, it comes out mirrored. Anyhow. Well, yeah. no, it's fine. It came out fine this side. Oh, good. Uh, anyhow, uh, obviously, your book is not done even after it's published, so I'm still going around talking about it. But I plan to talk about it and similar things for the next however much longer I have. I'm a little bit over the hill, as you can see. Um, I'm also uh, about to start a brand new project, which I'm uh, very excited about which is I'm going to be co-authoring a book with the brand new president of the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors, Todd Wolfson, who is an amazing leader and thinker and organizer, particularly an organizer. And we're going to be writing together about uh, the problems that higher education is facing today, and what can we do about it. Like uh, The Right to Learn, it is a to-do book, as well as 
because I'm a historian, of course, a lot of background. Oh, fantastic. I would love to see this book. I, I'm so would very... I, but I, I know. a lot of work. <laughs> you have to be done. I know. When uh, uh, Seriously, once you get a publication date, please let me know, and I'd be delighted to welcome the two of you to the forum to okay. celebrate. Okay. Um, and I just, I, I just have to brag, um, uh, Professor Schrecker is a, a hero of mine because she has done fantastic work on 20th century history, especially McCarthyism and higher education. Uh, so I'm... I, I'm going to stop fanboying for right now, but I just want to say welcome, welcome. Uh, but let me also now bring your colleague up um, on board. Uh, this is uh, Professor Valerie C. Johnson from DePaul University, and let me bring her up fully on stage. Good afternoon, Val. Good afternoon. Good to Thanks see you. Being here. Oh, I'm very, very glad you're here. And and you have, I just, now I can see you have dramatic lighting coming. Uh, oh, you know what? I, I, my no, light no, it's is great. probably off. It's I great. It's my like my glasses are glare. Oh, it, it all comes across beautifully. Um, okay. It looks, it looks um, I, I have so many questions to ask you. The first one is, to repeat the question I just asked your colleague, what are you going to be working on, Val, for the next year? What are the big topics and the big projects for yourself? Well, like uh, Ellen, you know, we will be talking about the book. Uh, we had intended the book to be a cautionary tale. We intended to uh, sort of um, sound the alarm on education gag orders. But now um, that uh, it seems like a fait accompli uh, nationwide, um, we will be talking about ways to counter uh, some of the effects okay. of uh, education ba uh, bans and uh, gag orders. Um, but uh, in my role as associate provost for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, I'll also probably be dedicating um, the large bulk of my time to revamping diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, initiatives. That is uh, probably certain given um, the uh, results of the, the election. And so um, like uh, before the election, I will be talking about um, the real skinny on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I know it has been politicized uh, to death. You know, of course, uh, Donald Trump, uh, our former president now, um, impending president, uh, but uh, he had banned uh, DEI initiatives in all federal agencies and then uh, doubled down to include uh, federal contractors and subcontractors, those doing business with the federal government. And then uh, first day in office, uh, President Biden reinstituted diversity, equity, inclusion. So I like to um, not assume that people understand what diversity, equity, inclusion is, and so mm -hmm. be more clear about what it is and uh, to uh, clarify that DEI is us. You know, when we talk about uh, creating a world where all people, in spite of identity, um, whatever that is, whether it's related to age or religion or um, LGBTQIA or whatever it whether it's about disability it is about the fair treatment uh, of all of us as human beings mm. so that will be um a yeoman's task indeed it will be it will be let me know how i can support it uh, at the very least when you have um, stuff that's published or uh, online somewhere i can definitely spread the word um, okay well here let me rearrange the screen a bit let me make this a little bit more balanced and comfortable um, and I have to say that um, we have uh, three editors, uh, and as uh, Ellen mentioned, uh, Jennifer Ruth, uh, professor at Portland State University, uh, previous guest, uh, she was a co-guest on one of our sessions about academic freedom, is terrific. She can't make it today, but we do miss her. Uh, she has a new film out that she co-directed called The Palestine Exception, which we want to recommend. Um, I have I have so many questions uh, for the two of you and and friends who are new to the forum. I'm going to ask a couple of questions to get the ball rolling, but I want you to be thinking about your questions for our guests. Uh, think about in particular what they're saying, what they're talking about, what your ideas are. But also, if you haven't had a chance to get it yet, if you look in the bottom left corner of the screen, you should see a kind of tan colored 
button that says the right to learn. That'll take you to the Beacon Press page so you can grab a copy of the book there as well. Uh, the first question I, I wanted to put to you all, and this is a kind of basic question, but and it, it, the question seems a little obvious now um, in late 2024, but when you started working on this book, what was the reason behind it? What drove you to it? What was the impetus behind creating um, this this title? And if, uh, if you could each take a handle at this, um, Professor Shrekker, please, if you want to go ahead. Okay. Um, well, back in, was it 2021, I think, mm -hmm. Valerie was very involved along with Jennifer Ruth, our, our co-editor, in a project getting uh, faculty senates to pass resolutions against what we were seeing out there, the early uh, education gag orders, right? Mm. And you had written up a kind of template, I believe, mm -hmm. for faculty senates. You could ask, Valerie was there at the very beginning, so why don't you yes. talk about it a bit? Okay, so uh, let me just kind of rewind a bit. I think the impetus for most people with these education bans was, um, you know, sort of um, racial reckoning after the George Floyd uh, uh, protests. Uh, I think uh, America began to look at itself during the um, pandemic and, um, you know, there all of a sudden became a clash in a culture war of sort uh, yeah. between um, our vision of America, as well as interpretation of, of, of America. And so um, accompanying that was these, as Ellen said, education uh, gag orders, state legislative gag orders. And so uh, Jennifer Ruth, uh, along with, well, actually it was the um, African American Policy Forum led by um, um, Kimberly Crenshaw. Mm -hmm. um, Kimberly Crenshaw's organization decide to confront these education bans and this culture war. And so uh, there was a, a project dedicated to literally warning faculty about the dangers of these education gag orders. And mm -hmm. so um, um, uh, Jennifer, myself, Emily Ho at uh, the University of Connecticut, we created this template and we uh, attempted to have uh, faculty senates across the, the country to reaffirm uh, a commitment to academic freedom, you know, a, a, a commitment that was devoid of any interference from board of trustees, university and college administrators, and state legislators. So that, that was the, the impetus. And so after that campaign, Ellen, who had written in the nation about it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. She was like, hmm, you know, um, and she was also a part of the faculty Senate campaign. Uh, she said, you know, maybe we should write a book about this. Uh, at the time, you know, the um, upcoming presidential election appeared like a blur, but, you know, as we got closer and closer to election day, I think, um, I think the relevance of this topic became very clear to, to most people. It, it did. Can you can you just quickly for people who might not be current with this, as well as for anybody who's listening to this on the recording in the future, can you give us an example of a couple of the gag orders? Okay. Well, they were. Let's take Florida, the poster boy. Of Please take Florida. No. Okay. You can. Uh, you can have Florida. Um, I'm scared of alligators. Anyhow, uh, we uh, realized that um, uh, Ron DeSantis, the uh, governor of Florida, was using this as a kind of straw man. He was, uh, you know, talking about uh, woke faculty members, and he was attacking uh, what was then called Chris, uh, critical race theory, CRT. And he was sort of uh, creating this monster idea, uh, stereotype of what universities were doing and getting laws passed in his state that would prevent uh, 
in the beginning, it was mainly focused on K through 12, and it's still out there in K through 12. But then he discovered you could get a lot of publicity, um, you know, slamming higher education as well. Mm. So that there are these laws that are preventing uh, teaching, uh, quote unquote, divisive concepts. Mm -hmm. Now, what's a divisive concept? Something like uh, the Civil War was fought in large part because of slavery. That's a divisive concept. What they turned out to be was an attack on sort of um, uh, teaching about social issues of social justice, teaching the truth about history or about gender or about America's sort of less than perfect past. And as these rules began to be turned into laws, um, we felt very much as if at least the academic community should have some weapons, intellectual weapons to fight back. And so uh, we, the three of us kind of got together. We found a very enthusiastic publisher. We're very pleased with the Beacon Press. They did very well by us, including what a, is clearly a gorgeous cover. Mm -hmm. And, and um, then we began to think about, well, who can we ask to help us with this? And we all sort of scoured our networks and came up with an amazingly diverse group of very brilliant academics and sort of journalists and other people. Maybe you want to talk about some of the people and what they were writing about now. Uh, yes, uh, PEN America is uh, by far probably the largest um, um, reservoir of um, information about these education bans uh, nationally. Hmm. If I could, I would love to, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, fr oh my gosh, you know, I know you give, you gave me a little primer on this system but um, okay, here I'm putting in the chat uh, the, the uh, PEN America report that compiles all of these education bans and you know legislative gag orders uh, across the country so your audience can see uh, how it affects uh, their, their, um, their states. And um, um, PEN America, so we had uh, uh, people from PEN America, we had uh, um, contingent faculty, we had professors at, for example, uh, University of Florida, University of Texas. I mean, we just had a, um, a elementary uh, focus, focusing on elementary education, teacher education. We just have a wide array of authors addressing this topic from their particular uh, vantage point. Um, but um, I definitely invite you all to go on, on this site and uh, see the chronicling of these education uh, gag orders. Uh, you'd be surprised, even in like uh, the blue state of Illinois, where I live, yeah. um, there were four introduced. And in, in, in I think 41 states now, there have been bills and legislation introduced. So that's how we kind of start off the book looking at these education gag orders, the impetus for the education uh, gag orders. And then we get to the heart of the matter in terms of why, what is the purpose of these education or legislative uh, bans on what can be taught in K through 12 and um, in higher education? Can I, can I just ask you to repeat that number? Did you say 41 states? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's probably 41 at this point, yes. Out of 50. I mean, just, uh, sorry, that just took me aback, just to think about the sheer scope of this. Uh, yeah. I mean, and you said bills introduced don't necessarily pass, but my God, that's... Yeah. Um, in the in the chat, by the way, uh, friends, um, first of all, um, thank you very much, Val, for sharing the, the link there, which you did perfectly. Um, we're going to have... Uh, uh, Jeremy or Jeffrey Young from Penn America is a guest in, uh, in January. Jeremy, yeah. Oh, Jeremy, yeah. He's yeah. Wonderful. absolutely wonderful. Which I'm really looking forward to. Yes. Oh, um, they have a chapter in, in the book. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. excellent. We have uh, one of our uh, one of our participants, uh, Daisy Nip, said, 
As a student, I was taught that we cannot read and access materials that were reserved and allocated for certain classes, grades, and academic programs that I am not a part of. I only stumbled across some of this because there was a problem technical migration. Wow, Daisy, that's that's uh, tremendous. Uh, Ed Webb uh, from Central Pennsylvania said, in our campus, a couple of invited speakers were disinvited due to things they had said or views attributed to them about Israel slash Palestine. Mm. There is some outside pressure from parents slash donors demanding review of certain classes on Israel slash Palestine. Uh, this is, so this is in response, I was asking people in the chat, how many of you have experienced such a, a, a gag order in, in, in your work? Um, and Ed, as a faculty member, has said, so far, none of us have agreed to review, uh, have agreed to review what or how we teach on those issues. Um, yeah, well, that's exactly what we hope people will do, which is stand up against what's clearly already happening and after January 20th may well be intensified, is to just say no. You know, just say no, and you'd be amazed. Or don't even respond. You mm. know, passive aggression works very well. We've mm. discovered that administrators, not you, Valerie, but <laughs> <laughs> Valerie is definitely not a passive aggressive person. But, no. uh, you know, the main thing that we, that faculty members that I've been reading about and uh, hearing about are being pushed by their administrators to go along with this. They complain, they say, I'm not teaching biased history. I'm just teaching what really happened. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, been studying mm -hmm. this for 20 years. I know these things are true, or, it's, or at least as to my knowledge are true, and I'd like to uh, share them with my students and the broader public. Uh, and if you um, sort of say, no, I, I don't think I've, my, my uh, syllabus isn't ready yet. I uh, work on my syllabus when I see what kind of class I have. Mm -hmm. You know, just a little passive aggressive and then not answer their emails again. I mean, this is my theory that we can, there are ways to avoid it. Uh, you know, it's going to be very scary. And we really, what well, my big pitch is, I think we could say solidarity, stick together. This mm -hmm. stuff is coming. It's going to be bad. It's already bad. Certainly for people who work on the Middle East, it's terrible already. It was terrible before last October too. And, you know, it, uh, so we really have to be very careful and, uh, really stick together in every way we can. Um, yeah. Yeah. As my mother would say, um, when you fail to be proactive, she'd say, um, the horse has left the barn. Mm. Or another way of putting it, the train has left the station. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, education, uh, gag orders, legislative bans, whatever you want to call them, are coming to you. Uh, particularly if you are an educator or just as a member of the public, you know, just it, it will be a silencing, a constriction, if you will, of the um, amount of information or the type of information uh, you will be exposed to. If you by chance have had to uh, an opportunity to look over Project 2025, um, I know that um, former President Donald Trump kind of distanced himself from Project 2025. 25 during the election, but the presumption is that that will guide federal government policy. And we know that, um, you know, federal funds is a great incentive for uh, board of trustees and university administrators to mm -hmm. play along, right? Uh, they are concerned with dollars and increasingly as Ellen, uh, Ellen's um, sole chapter, um, sole author chapter in the book discusses, you know, education has taken a hit from the 1960s, right? Uh, funding uh, matters. And we know, of course, that um, the baby boomer, boomers, you know, that generation is gone, enrollment uh, has shrunk, and, you know, universities are in competition, and they'll do anything to keep the doors open. 
And so um, there, there's going to be some there, there, there are going to be some casualties. But I agree with Ellen that um, it is going to uh, be imperative that we mobilize ourselves and that we begin to push back. Right? Uh, there is a a, a reason for. Uh, knowledge, uh, the attainment of knowledge, and particularly in a democratic society, in order to make uh, important choices about leaders, about public policy, mm -hmm. you have to be informed, right? And so we don't want conformity. We don't, you know, we want to live out um, the values that we purport to have in, in America and have a free thinking, informed uh, society. Yeah. And Valerie, your article, your chapter in our book is worth a whole book as far as I'm concerned. Oh, no. It's absolutely brilliant because she really explains why these sort of MAGA uh, right wing populists and plutocrats are going after higher education. And she talks about in the title of her essay is so wonderful, The Epistemology of Ignorance and Its Impact on Democracy in Higher Education. She's really talking about a campaign to make America dumb again. <laughs> Mada. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that historically um, that has been the case when you look at, you know, just sort of the erasure of history the erasure of the story of various oppressed groups. I don't care whether you're talking about sexual identity, women, uh, race and ethnicity, religion. Um, you know, there is a, a, a big swath of information and knowledge that um, has historically been suppressed. And that sounds kind of like a conspiracy theory. Uh, but unfortunately, that conspiracy theory is, you know, real life in front of us in living color. And um, it is really, I mean, I, I tell you, every time I think of it, which is practically every second of the day, um, every time I think of it, I'm sort of heartbroken. You know, um, there was a time when, of course, our values didn't align with our practice in our country. You know, starting from the Declaration of Independence, uh, you know, all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. You know, we know that certain groups were excluded from that, right? And there are groups that have historically been excluded. But I thought that the trajectory was moving toward greater rights, more rights, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not fewer rights. And so it's sort of like turning around the ship, you know, we are going back to the shore. Um, and uh, it, it, it really is heartbreaking um, because as an American, I had um, fully sort of bought into the possibility of living out uh, the values that we profess. Well, I, I, both of you, I appreciate that, that, that historical framing as well as uh, as your sense of the crisis that we're in. Uh, I, I have more questions, but I, I want to turn it over to the audience for their questions. And we've already had some comments in the chat. I wanted to share these quickly. We've had a couple of comments about Florida and a couple about Texas. Um, our dear friend in Ohio, Stephen Volk, says, uh, shared a link to the uh, Florida Department of Education's list of 700 banned books. Um, we also have a comment from uh, Judith Sebesta. And Judith, I hope I didn't mangle your last name. Uh, she says she works as a consultant in higher ed and has been assisting in planning some statewide events in Texas. And I'm told I cannot talk about or consider the importance of diversity of the speakers of the events. Uh, also in Texas, our friend Melanie Hogue says that she's at a liberal arts private university in Texas, but expecting the private universities will be forced to be under the same restrictions and prohibitions and bans as our public institutions. Uh, and our friend Eileen Frank in Florida says, here's a thing from August 26th. Florida Faculty Union pushes back a state directive to review course syllabi and materials. And there's a link to uh, a local source. Um, uh, friends, just really quickly, uh, and a meta question, um, 
this chat is really kicking off. There's a lot going on. Would you mind if I save that um, and uh, anonymize it and extract it for a blog post down the road? Please let me know in the chat. Um, we have questions that have come in, and I, I want to make sure that, that everyone gets a chance to ask their questions. And this is one from uh, Professor Ed Webb at Dickinson College in Pennsylvania that I mentioned before. And he asks, to what extent, if any, can unions and professional associations help address these challenges? I'm aware of the ALA's work pushing back on book bans. That's the American Library Association. Is this a problem at all? So what do you think? Uh, I'll, I'll put that back up on the screen so you can all see it again. Um, can unions and professional organizations help address these challenges? What do you think, Val I think, and Ellen? Well, go ahead, Ellen. I think it's absolutely crucial that um, I, I just had written a, a foreword to a book about a man who's my hero during the McCarthy period, a mathematician at the University of Michigan, who stood on the First Amendment, not the third, Fifth Amendment, and mm. lost his job and went to prison. And there's a happy ending because he's so wonderful. But mm. um, anyhow, uh, what I wrote in my foreword was that I think this guy's name was Chandler Davis. Uh, was amazing. He was my hero. He was true to the Constitution, to his own moral, uh, you know, a, a sense of right and wrong. And uh, but he wasn't bitter. You know, he continued to fight. He continued to write. I mean, he was brilliant. Uh, and uh, he never gave up. Mm. But my feeling is we don't need heroes if we're going to be facing what is worse much worse than mccarthy uh, and we're waiting for the heroes to emerge we're going in the wrong direction we don't need heroes what we need is for everybody who knows the difference between right and wrong, who knows that um, the slaves were not very happy under slavery before the Civil War, who understands how the world works, um, that they have to get involved. They have to go to demonstrations. They have to, you know, send letters to their congressmen and all that kind of stuff. And they have to keep it up. You can't just do one letter to a congressman. You know, every time something comes up, you've got to send them the letters. People do pay attention to those things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we. I have this vision that, uh, you know, someday some really dreadful, stupid thing comes out of Congress and um, the... Uh, faculty unions all get together and the student groups get together and they all have a march and people are sitting around in their offices or they no longer have offices. They're sitting around in front of their computer at home and they say, hey, let's go down to Central Square and join the march. And everybody does that. That's my vision of it be of resistance being so normal mm -hmm. that everybody's going to do it because they know right from wrong. And I think um, that's the only way to go. Unions, mm -hmm. solidarity, you know, not waiting for some hero to emerge because that's not going to save higher education today. That's a fact. That is a fact. Um, you know, Frederick Douglass said many moons ago, power concedes nothing without a demand, never has, never will. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a, a, a fact. And so uh, resistance is uh, crucial, whether it's uh, your various associations, educational associations or neighborhood associations, church or religious related organizations. I think uh, uh, as a political scientist, having taught political science for 30 years on race and issues of class. I think that, um, you know, I have never seen um, legislators just come up with a brilliant idea without some demand coming from the public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
you know, maybe uh, maybe this forum can be a place to surface some of those demands. Val and, and Ellen, thank you for that for the great answers. Um, and uh, Ed, thank you for the uh, excellent question and uh, and for the comments. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, what Ed just offered is an example of a Q&A box question. So if you'd like to ask a question like that, just remember going to the very bottom of the screen, there's that white strip running along it, and look for the question mark button and, and you can type that in. Um, if, if Brian, if I can interrupt, I, I saw a question going by and I really would like to address it. Uh, because I don't want to uh, leave the audience in any way, uh, you know, sort of thinking that uh, our book or anything that I've said or my title is saying that people are stupid. There is a big difference between, uh, well, the, the uh, comment said something about the, the um, uh, and that's a paraphrase, that the title uh, of my chapter, Epistemology of Ignorance, suggests that people are stupid. We're not suggesting that at all. I'm not suggesting that at all. Again, there's a big difference between ignorance and stupid. I could be, as a college professor, I could be ignorant about a lot of things. And believe me, every day that I live, I realize how ignorant I am. Just, I mean, if you don't have the information and knowledge, you just don't have the information and knowledge. That doesn't mean that you can't learn, right? However, the way that information is packaged in um, even a free society, uh, had you know has uh, certain imperatives. We know that students don't learn uh, about slavery. You know, I mean, it's uh, uh, it's constant. I've I've talked to friends of mine who have kids, grandkids in school, and they learn that you know, um, hey, all the slaves were happy. You know what I mean? We put a positive spin on it. And in political science, we say there's uh, a reason for that. You know, sort of like quote unquote system maintenance. We want, uh, we don't want to tell kindergartners that we, you know, uh, um, uh, had a, a genocidal raid against the Native Americans. That would not en engender, you know, sort of nationalism or pride in our okay. country if we just brutally uh, in educated people that, hey, we've, we've had some problems. So people just sort of play along. And therefore, they're they're ignorant. You see the presentation of history, not only in books, but also in just our lived environments, mem memorials. Who do we venerate, right? Those become a source of knowledge. And certainly, they leave out a lot of people who have had a significant impact on, um, you know, the, the democratic experiment. And so... We're not saying, you know, people are stupid. We're just saying that um, we've left out a, a lot of knowledge that will be very important to addressing some of the um, challenges that we face as a society. Challenges that, again, leave the bulk of people out. Thank you. Thank you. That's I, I really appreciate you grabbing that. And thank you for multitasking. Um, uh, going through this, the uh, the, the chat is, is very live. Uh, friends, in case you uh, uh, didn't see it, on the bottom left-hand corner of the screen is a little tan box with a link to the right to learn, and that'll take you to the Beacon Press page for the book, so you can grab it there. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions, again, the chat is very lively right now, um, but you can also ask us a video question. So um, as you can tell, you don't have to have a beard in order to be on stage. So just click the raised hand button and, and uh, I'll bring you up. And of course, you can ask a Q&A box uh, question. In fact, we have another one of those questions now from our good friend in Scotland, Donald Clark. Although I say good friend in Scotland, he roves all over the place. So I'm not sure where he actually is today, um, but uh, I'm just going to assign him his Scottish history and ancestry right now. And he asked this question. McCarthyism was a product of the Cold War under the Democratic President Truman. Does the new challenge come from the clear Democratic mandate and widely held belief that higher ed has brought this upon itself. Okay, I'll, I'll, let me flash that on the screen again so you can see it. It's a very challenging question. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, now, forgive me for sounding like a conspiracy theorist because this is exactly what's happened during the McCarthy period. Hmm. When I began to look at what happened during McCarthyism, and I've written a whole bunch of books about it. Mm -hmm. um, what I found that, that was fascinating 
was that it wasn't welling up from the grassroots. There weren't uh, people, uh, you know, writing, uh, contacting universities. I looked for letters in the papers of college mm -hmm. presidents and things, and I didn't find anything except for things that were mm -hmm. sort of organized postcards that people mm -hmm. could uh, sign in. Um, it wasn't that people were afraid that their kids were going to be uh, indoctrinated by, with Marxism. They really didn't care. Hmm. Uh, there were people who cared. There, these were people who were involved in a kind of anti-communist network, people who felt very strongly uh, about um, what they thought communism was. By the 1950s, communism in the United States, the American Communist Party, was a little sect, uh, had very few members, many of whom were actually FBI informants. Uh, and what we uh, did not see was a grassroots movement. What hmm. we did see was people with power already, uh, like Republicans, um, this was a very partisan movement in many ways, just like what we're seeing today, mm -hmm. that uh, the Republican Party after, during and after World War II had not been in power since mm -hmm. 1933. Mm -hmm. And in the election of 1948, they assumed that uh, the Republicans were going to win. They were uh, creeping up in the electorate. Uh, but they didn't. It was a surprise win for Harry Truman and the Democrats. And what seemed pretty clear at the time was that they were running against the New Deal. They were running against labor unions. They were running against Social Security. They were running against a whole bunch of reforms that had helped to bring the United States out of the Depression. And so they needed a new platform. They needed a new program. And they bought into the notion of the that or the the idea that the United States was somehow losing the Cold War, which had just begun. Mm -hmm. you know, no, nobody had ever thought about nuclear weapons before. They see, oh my gosh, Russia has the bomb. That now that really did happen and it did happen in part because there were spies within the bomb project we know that um but uh in 1953 at the high point of mccarthyism there were no uh communists essentially no communists within the government and no russian spies except for people who were doing it for money uh anyhow the uh issue was like today, that this network of anti-communists were uh, feeding information to ambitious politicians. Just like when I said the, uh, I think I may have said earlier that the pushback against the 60s uh, was particularly fueled by how well a certain group of politicians uh, used uh, opposition to universities, opposition to uh, liberal ideas, uh, to win uh, elections, like Ronald Reagan, who got his start running against the University of California. Uh, the person who got his start in politics through uh, looking for communists in government, which was the Republicans' main uh, slogan, as it were, uh, was Richard Nixon. So uh, we're seeing the same thing happening today. And in our book, we have a chapter by a uh, political scientist named uh, Isaac Kamola about the right wing network that has been funded by billionaires, right wing billionaires like the Koch brothers, who have been for the past 50 years or so mounting a campaign of disinformation and uh, open attacks at, 
and demonizing the academic community, which has made it so hard to fight back against what we're seeing today. So that's sort of a historical take on uh, that really excellent question. Yeah. And, and part of that uh, question, it asks, uh, did we bring this on ourselves? Uh, did higher education bring this on ourselves? And to a certain extent, the answer is yes, because uh, American education has sought to expand the Western canon, uh, just a, a, you know, just a sort of myopic view of, um, you know, knowledge around the world just isn't enough for, you know, a global society or, um, a, a, you know, the, the, the younger generation who are, who kind of see some of the contradictions and want to understand them better in the classroom. So I think by expanding um, uh, knowledge um, through uh, and beyond the Western canon, I think, yeah, we did bring it on ourselves and people, you know, didn't like it. They did not like that other groups were, um, you know, of course, um, had, uh, you know, some spotlight, if you will, on issues um, uh, besieging and besetting them. And, um, you know, uh, I think it's almost kind of like, um, yeah, we did bring it on ourselves, but um, that's not a bad thing. I think that we have advanced the state of uh, education by um, moving beyond the, the Western canon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Donald is a, a brilliant person and I, I admire the penetration of the question. And Ellen and Valerie, I love your two very different answers, which go into so much depth. Um, friends, we're, we're coming up on the end of time, as it were, or at least for our hour. We have about nine minutes left. I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask their question. Uh, the chat box is on fire. People are, are throwing out all kinds of good ideas. Uh, if we have time, I want to circle back to a couple of them, but we have another question. And this is from uh, Stephen Volk, a uh, professor at uh, uh, Oberlin College, who I've mentioned before, who's a fantastic blogger, by the way. Steve, if you get a chance, please share your uh, your blog URL in the chat because it's incredibly powerful stuff. And he has this question. Let me just get, sit with us for a minute. How will higher ed be able to make the necessary connections to so many who are or will be suffering in many ways under Trump if we only voice our own concerns? How do we reach out? You know, I'm sorry, I flashed that by too quickly. Let me put it back up on the stage. I mean, how will we be able to make the necessary connections to those who will suffer under Trump if we only voice our own concerns? How do we reach out? That's such a great question. Yeah. It really is. I've been trying to figure it out now for 50 years. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, here's uh, Trump who's been to an Ivy League school. Same with J.D. Vance. What did we, how did we fail them? How did we fail the rest of society? What we have to do is really rethink what higher education stands for and how we can make a more just, a more humane society. And we have to listen. We have to listen. We can't, I, I'm very good at uh, speaking and speaking and speaking, uh, but you know, we need to listen to what people are concerned about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I personally uh, felt that what we weren't listening enough to was people talking about the price of eggs mm -hmm. in the recent election. You know, just the price of eggs is enough to make you very dissatisfied with what's going on in the world. So how do we talk about the price of eggs? Because we're all paying what is it, about three times as much as we were a few years ago. So, you know, our concerns are the same as other people's concerns, uh, and their concerns are our concerns, and we have to be really uh, attuned to that. Uh, what are bright spots are some of the recent union campaigns within the academic community. Uh, like the teacher strikes in Chicago and Los mm -hmm. Angeles, mm -hmm. where people are reaching out to parents who are, of course, more concerned, much more concerned than anything else. But they realize that they've always liked teachers 
and teachers always cared about parents' kids and that they had so much in common that they were able to force the authorities to give in to union demands. So I think we have to think about, you know, a word, a phrase that uh, we all, at least those of us in higher education, always use, and I hate it because they never know what they're talking about, which is the common good. We're mm -hmm. all in this together, and we have mm -hmm. to somehow recognize this and act on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of my colleagues at uh, DePaul, she is actively engaged in um, civic education because that's something that we lost, right? Mm -hmm. This form of, you know, this, this sort of devotion to civil society. Um, needless to say, we individualism is a vaulted concept in America. Mm -hmm. And so it's no wonder that people think individualistically. Um, the political science department at DePaul, we put on a pre-election and post-election forum. So at the post-election forum uh, last week, we, um, you know, we, after we, the talking heads, we finished talking about why, you know, our explanations for um, the outcome of the election. We asked the students to explain, the, uh, you know, uh, their point of view. And uh, so one of the questions that I asked uh, us students was, you know, what about bodily autonomy? I thought that that was uh, an issue that resonated particularly among women. And it was thought that uh, white women would, you know, sort of uh, mm -hmm. join in with other women and it would be all about bodily autonomy. And uh, so, but it, it wasn't reflected in the, the final outcome of the vote, you know, there didn't appear to be any resonant fears about, um, you know, um, a, a nationwide ban on abortion, right? And then there was quite a bit of misogyny in the messaging in the election. So what, what in fact happened? Well, the student explained that a friend of hers who was a Trump supporter um, felt like, oh, that's no problem uh, because if I find myself in a red state, I can just, and I need an abortion, I can just, you know, catch a flight and go to another state. And I was just like, oh my God, wow. Um, you know, that's a very individualistic answer, you know, just no regard for, okay, well, what about other women, right? But again, it's no surprise because we have literally you know, enshrined in individualism. And I do think that, you know, we all want to be viewed as an individual, not based on any particular identity, but when it comes to, you know, um, you know, living uh, in, in the collective, living in, um, you know, uh, when you talk about this, good, we have to think, think beyond that, uh, unless we would like to go back to the state of nature, right? where everyone was on their own you know governments were formed why for the common good and so if the if 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 we are not uh thinking about you know the common good over our individual good if we're not talking to people who don't agree with us uh then we're in big trouble the common, thank you thank you both again you've, you've offered such complimentary uh, answers that are so deep and so thoughtful. Stephen, uh, thank you for asking this. Uh, that's going to be some of the, some of the work that we need to do. Um, we're almost out of time, uh, and I wanted to surface one topic that has come up. If we could just quickly uh, touch on this, uh, and this has come up throughout the chat, but also in in the world too. Um, the uh, question of consequences. Um, we had. Uh, uh, Two friends um, in the chat uh, observed uh, the problem of acting, of taking steps, uh, if the risks might be too great. So, for example, uh, Lisa Durf says, say no and lose our job. Uh, I think not responding is the safer option. And then um, at, uh, uh, in, uh, in Texas, uh, our friend uh, Melanie Hogue said, uh, that, uh, oops, hang on a second, just, uh, yes, staff of the institution are in an at-will employment state. We have been and are used to being quiet, even outside the workplace, because of the fear of losing employment and are being marked as trouble. 
um, I, I think that's going to be a widespread belief, uh, especially as, as both of you know so well, the largest population of faculty in the United States are adjuncts who are at will. Um, and staff, generally speaking, don't have uh, employment guarantees such as tenure. And of course, students are, are um, you know, a whole other, other world. How, how can we advise people to resist these kind of gag orders? How can we advise people to fight for the right to learn given such risks? With a lot of humility and a lot of solidarity, you know, but the thing is, let's prepare in advance. Let's not wait until the heads are rolling, you know, and let's not think that they're not coming after us. After all, they got the president of Harvard and Penn and Columbia. They can get any one of us at any time. So let's begin talking about sticking together. Uh, students, faculty, staff, we know that there are people, uh, you know, who are really in uh, serious trouble. Perhaps they were born in Palestine, for example, um, and we haven't touched that third rail. But um, clearly, it's if you look at the long haul, that's just an intensification of what's been going on all along. You take an unpopular position and uh, donors or, uh, you know, politicians begin to squawk and uh, you have to assume that your administration is not going to fight for you. But if everybody does, if we really, really prepare ourselves, join the AAUP, join the union, join a little local group you know, in your neighborhood. I mean, I'm seeing, I live in Manhattan, we're in a big apartment building, and I'm noticing that people are beginning to talk more to each other, that there are, there's an assumption that uh, this is, you know, a very uh, blue district and a very blue apartment building. But um, we're talking to each other. We're talking about what can we do, you know, maybe a whole bunch of us will now say 771 uh, is uh, against gag rules. You know, we have to work and think collectively. Mm -hmm. That's the mantra, my mantra for the moment. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's a realistic question. I mean, if you're threatened to lose your job, everyone wants to be able to pay their bills. Uh, and so it has to be, as Ellen was saying, that, you know, you have to begin to, to mobilize, perhaps quietly at, at first. Um, critical mass is necessary. You don't even need the majority of people to exert change. Um, but I think it's critical that we ask ourselves, what type of nation do we want to live in? That is a critical question. Have we lost our devotion to free expression? Have we lost our devotion to democracy? If the answer to those questions are yes, then there's nothing needed. We could just sit back and accept it, right? But if the answer is that we want to live in a de democracy that provides, um, you know, um, rights for every single person, and that is about the collective good, if we want to um, live in a society where, you know, love and is, is, is the, the key term and not hate and divisiveness. If we do, then we're going to have to put something on the line, right? I have eaten from trees that I didn't plant. And I think in my lifetime, which will not last forever, in my lifetime, it is imperative that I grow some trees, that I plant some trees, right, for the next generation. Think about the lives of your children, the lives of your grandchildren. Is this really the type of society that we want? If the answer is no, then we have to begin to um, to mobilize. I, I'm. That's a fantastic moment uh, to end on to, for today on mobilization and solidarity, and especially the theme of care. Um, we are over time, and, and I, I have to I have to pause this for right now. Can can I first of all thank both of you, Ellen Schrecker and Valerie Johnson, for being fantastic scholars, fantastic uh, guests, 
and especially fantastic people. Thank you so much for being with okay. us. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, how can we how can we keep up with uh, with your work over the over the next year? What's the best way? I don't know. Okay. Google. I can put my email address in the um, in the chat, uh, but I have to warn everyone: my uh, inbox looks like the place that email go to die these days. I, I, um, I <laughs> but understand. I will get around to responding at some point. I understand completely, and I'm grateful both of you made the time today. Uh, please right. continue the excellent work. Uh, everybody, make sure you grab a copy of uh, The Right to Learn, and uh, thank you both. Be safe. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. But uh, everybody, don't leave just yet. I need to point out where we're headed next. Um, let me thank everybody for the great questions and the, the great comments. Uh, coming up, uh, if you want to keep talking about these questions of how to build solidarity uh, or continue themes from the chat, uh, we have uh, all kinds of options on social media from Twitter slash X to LinkedIn, Mastodon, Threads, and Blue Sky. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions on this and related topics, you can take a look at our archive. Just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive and look at more than 400 uh, previous programs. If you'd like to look at our sessions coming up on other topics, we have everything from AI, Edictability, World Futures Day, Community Session, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. And thank you all once more for the excellent conversation. It's great to be thinking together with all of you. I hope everybody is safe and sound, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye, all. <laughs>